and girls, ladies and gentlemen, or anyone who identifies otherwise, maybe you're a super intelligent shade of the colour sky blue pink. Who are we to say you're none of those things? Um, today, my guest is James, and we thought we'd have really just a natter about a few things that James has had on his mind for a number of different reasons. So I'll pass over to him. He's going to ask me some questions, uh, as I understand it, and I'll do my utmost to come up with something remotely sensible as an answer. So, James, first of all, tell us a bit about yourself, your background, where you're coming from, and what it is you're trying to achieve, and then we'll get into questions. Okay. Well, my name is James. I am a 34-year-old male human. Um, I'm an engineer by trade. Uh, I spent seven years as a laboratory automation engineer working for the enemy, Big Pharma. Um, Then my career there kind of came to an abrupt end due to COVID. It gave me a very welcome opportunity to work out where to go next and and what to do. So I spent a lot of time kind of studying in, in the COVID lockdowns. And I never, I didn't find anything I wanted to do. I ended up going to the University of York to do an MSc in digital systems engineering. Part way through that, so February of 2022, I was cycling in and out of campus a lot, like really every day. And I just, this was before I'd gone carnival. I couldn't, I couldn't keep going. It was in and out of the toilet, awful, awful bowel issues eczema that's been a problem my whole life it was just getting all worse and worse I was eating potatoes and oats and all this like they tell you to and cruciferous vegetables all that and it was getting bad then anthony chafee pops up on on youtube and i thought you know what i've got to give this a try and i know you, you tell people not to switch the diet immediately but all those side effects of switching quickly they were that was my life so i had to i had to do something drastic Anyway, I spent a lot of time learning from yourself, from from the other doctors and such in the space. And now just over a year later, I've gone full carnival. I was half asking it, you know, two weeks, beer and pizza, mm. three weeks, beer and pizza. Could see great gains over a, a year. But in in the last 32 days, it's it's night and day. It's unbelievable. And I don't want to go back. Yeah. Probably haven't had my last whiskey, but I've definitely had my last beer for sure. Okay. So, uh, well, that's a yes, big call. And, and, that's a big call. Yeah, well, it, I think it's the yeast. Like, as soon yeah. as I start, I can do one, mm. and then as soon as the second one touches my lips, oh god, no! It's yeah. like I can't. Yeah. Mm. So, going into the future now, I, I want, I want to help spread spread this way of life because to me, it is a way of life. It's not just a way of eating, and I can see in my friends and family how much it would help them. You know, I, I came back from, from university in, uh, back end of October last year, I weighed 95 kilos. And last time I weighed myself was about f- five weeks ago, 81. And I reckon I'm probably down to 78 now. So you don't realize how, how much weight, visceral fat, I suppose, that you're packing. Is That's been my great lesson over the last six months. Right. Yeah. You know? Awesome. So yes, yeah, sorry, going forward, I want to sp- spread this around. And I figured the, a great way to do that would be to speak to you about diseases or discomforts, should we say, mm. that have affected my my friends and family. And so if you're happy, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll move on with that. Yeah, you bet. Let's, so, let's, let's get into some of these, some of these issues that, that various members of your family have been grappling with. And, yeah. and I'll give you my take on them to the best of my understanding. Right. Well, my aunt passed away, Some one of my aunts passed away some years ago from a, a, a truly horrendous disease called mitochondrial myopathy. And uh, just as before we came on here, you, you explained to me that it's a genetic disease. So I'd like you to talk about the mechanisms at play in case anyone else, you know, it's, it's generally young people who find out they've got mitochondrial myopathy. And so if a carnivore diet can help them. And there's a clip on YouTube of, of you explaining that. I've done my part for those people. I sure, so. sure. Right. Well, yeah, as you as you rightly identify, it, it, it is a genetic disease where a person's mitochondria. Now, for, for those that don't know or, or need a, a refresher, the mitochondria are tiny little organelles that live inside every one of our cells. Um, and they're thousands per cell. 
uh, especially in muscles and sometimes in their tens of thousands and above in various different muscle cells. And these are the guys that produce the energy that the, the cells of our body use to do metabolic work, basically. And if anything goes wrong with the, the genes that control the mitochondria, either the mitochondrial genes themselves or indeed some of the nuclear genes which um, encode for some of the proteins that are expressed inside the mitochondria that make them work. If anything goes wrong with those, that genetic code, then those mitochondria will not work properly. And as a result of that, cells that are affected by that will start to die off before their time. They will start to undergo what's called apoptosis or, or programmed cell self-destruct, if you like to think of it that way. Now, every one of our cells in our body at some point has a potential or a likelihood to go, that's the end of my life as a cell and I'm shutting down, I'm self-destructing, we're going to hit the red button. And at some point in your life, when you get to the level where so many of your cells have shut down that your body is no longer functional, that will be the time of your death, basically. And unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done about mitochondrial myopathies because they are encoded for hardwired in a, in a genetic fault that's in, inborn, basically. What we can do is minimize the likelihood that any given cell will self-destruct at any given time. And the way to do that is to lead the most blameless life possible in terms of inflammatory, pro-inflammatory um, processes. So myopathy is the other part of that. Word. So mitochondria, those little organelles. Um, myopathy, myo refers to muscles. And pathy, obviously, is disease of. So what we're talking about is disease of the muscle cells because of mitochondrial dysfunction. That's that's the whole breakdown of that. All right. So what do we do? We lead a life that is not inflammatory or is as anti-inflammatory as possible. I have a video on my channel, which has been there for some time now, which is one of my brief series of videos I was doing at one point, which was in five minutes or less was the challenge I set oh, I myself, and I had a clock up on the screen and it counted down from five to, and I had to explain a topic in five minutes or less. In that video, there are four hacks, life hacks, for anti-inflammatory effect on a person, any given person. It's generalized advice, it's not specific, but it's advice any person can take on board, including someone with a disease like this, which is likely to be affected negatively by inflammation. And those four hacks, in order, <clears throat> excuse me, of importance, if you like, are number one, a fully 100% carnivorous diet, or as close to that as a person can possibly muster. That's the single most important, most effective thing a person can do to reduce their likelihood of being inflamed. Most inflammation yeah. is dietary. And almost invariably, that dietary inflammation comes from plant toxins, anti-nutrients, fiber, sugars, complex carbohydrates, all pro-inflammatory. Add in any amount of seed oils, industrial seed oils in your diet, and you're asking for inflammation. It's an absolute guaranteed fait accompli that you will be inflamed to some degree if you do if you eat any plant material and, and any seed oils. So if you're going to do nothing else, get rid of all plant materials and all seed oils. That will reduce your risk of inflammation hugely right there. Number two, there is a range of nutraceuticals available, which is a, they're called nutritional supplements because they have to be labeled as something. Mm -hmm. There are one or two things in there of nutritive value in the product but that's not really the point that's like oh yeah, it's got some anti anti-inflammatory uh oh, sorry some um antioxidant effect is what i mean there's there's, you know, there's 
one or two of those kind of things in it. That's not the point. This is a range of products that I'm joint ventured with, so you need to know that for full disclosure. And it's a company called Cerul, C-E-R-U-L-E, and they produce this product that causes a person's bone marrow to release their own adult stem cells into circulation. These are blank cells with your DNA. Their normal role in the body is they tool around in the blood and they find inflammatory process in your tissues and they send out care packages, exosomes as it turns out, and that's a, a term you'll be familiar with because of recent events in the world, shall we say. Um, exosomes oh, yeah. encapsulate viral particles when you're infected with a virus, but also exosomes can be made in the body to encapsulate good things as well. They're just a package. These particular exosomes have basically first aid kits for the, for the body in them, so they can tone down inflammation. If an adult stem cell encounters cancerous tissue, it can send a message to that cancerous cell to undergo apoptosis, cell destruction. So that's yep. powerful. Or an adult stem cell can find a tissue, a cell, that is damaged to the degree where it's not worth repairing. It needs replacing with a new one, and it will bind to that. It will differentiate into a brand new cell of the kind that's required for that tissue, and the old one is dissolved and gobbled up and and um, taken away for refuse disposal and or recycling, as the case may be, for the various components of that cell. So these things are really, really powerful, is what I'm telling you. This is an incredible product, and as an, as an anti-inflammatory product that goes along with that, that's synergistic, et cetera, et cetera. So that's always, for me, that's number two on my list, because it's about renewal and repair of tissues that are damaged. Now, an adult stem cell cannot repair a genetic disease because it's got the DNA of the person encoded already. It's just a blank cell with that person's DNA. So if there's a genetic disease, the stem cell can't fix that. So yeah. this is not a solution to the disease, but it's a solution to assist with the anti-inflammatory effect of the, of the carnivore diet. So it's powerfully yeah. synergistic with that. So that's number two. Okay. Number three sounds crazy. Sounds like crystal waving woo woo. Sounds like hairy legged hippie stuff. You'd think, oh, oh okay, now this guy's got no credibility as soon as I say this. Well, you might think that until you have a look at my other, one of my other five minutes or less videos where I cover the science behind this. There are about 19 different studies published that I quote in this one five minute video about this. And here's what it is ground yourself electrically to the earth as much of the time as is possible. So I didn't mention, but I'm also a massive yogi. And, okay, uh, awesome. That is a big, big, big thing in, in the yoga community. Yeah. Uh, yep. Interesting. Could you, uh, could you riff on that for a bit, please? Yeah, we evolved grounded to the earth. We walked around barefoot on the earth. We slept on the earth. We were connected to the earth. We were a part of the earth and its electromagnetic field for millions of years. Then in the last 150 years or so, we've disconnected ourselves almost all the time. We wear, wear rubber-soled shoes. Yeah. We live in electrically insulated dwellings these days. We yeah. drive around in cars. We work in offices. We're almost never connected electrically to the earth. And as such, that causes real problems in terms of, among other things, inflammation. Can, can you talk about that at, at the, the cellular level, I suppose? Absolutely, yeah. The problem with not being grounded is that your tissues will undergo vastly more oxidative damage because when people think about oxidation, they usually equate that with oxygen, probably rightly so because, well, it's in the title, oxidation, oxidative damage. So you think oxygen is the problem. Actually, however, Oxidation is a chemical process whereby electrons are removed from proteins, lipoproteins, so fat protein molecules, various even carbohydrate molecules and, and those kind of things. 
can have electrons ripped out of them by free radicals, which are things that cause oxidation to occur. So oxidation doesn't necessarily involve oxygen. Oxygen is the most powerful oxidative agent we know of. That's how the term oxidation came about in the first place, before we understood what electrons were and that oxygen was stealing electrons from things every time it came close enough to get that done. Um, but that's how that nomenclature came came about with, with oxidation, shall we say. When you are electrically grounded to the Earth, you are able to absorb electrons directly out of the Earth into your body, and those electrons gravitate to structures that have had electrons torn out of them by free radicals, and replace those electrons, re- basically repair that damage. The thing that okay. we're told that we're supposed to get from antioxidants in our food, we're told we must get in antioxidants, otherwise we'll get oxidative damage. That's why we need antioxidants. Well, that's only true if you never grown yourself to the earth. Because an antioxidant is a chemical substance that donates electrons to repair those holes of the electrons that have been ripped out. Yeah. So why not cut out the middleman, never mind nutritional antioxidants, and get the antioxidant activity by directly absorbing electrons from the earth into your body? So I had I have quite a background in physics and engineering. So could you maybe go a bit deeper on how electrons I suppose come up through the feet, through the skin, through the muscle fibers? Yeah, electrons I mean, are attracted to their conjugate electrochemical charge couple. Yeah. In any positively charged particle, basically. And when you rip an electron out of an otherwise evenly charged thing, you leave that thing with a positive charge hole where that electron was. And that will attract yeah. an electron that's free to that hole by basic. Um, electromagnetic attraction. So, in general, there is a, a there is a positive charge to the human body as long as it's disconnected from the Earth. As soon as you connect to the Earth, within a few milliseconds, you'll start to absorb electrons out of the Earth, and your charge will normalize with the with the ground charge, and your the voltage of your body will drop to zero, which you can then test with a multimeter, or very close to yeah. zero. It never gets to exactly zero. It'll be point zero something millivolts if you're properly grounded. So that's that's the the process of, of attraction of electrons to positively charged um, particles of any kind or molecules of any kind. The actual mechanics of that is via the transfer of pseudo-photons, if you want to get into that, but that's probably for another day. Apparently, my internet connection is unstable, and now it's not. I'm back. Yeah. I lost you for a bit. Yeah, I was but, just yeah, saying that the, um, the actual mechanism of the attraction is via the transfer of pseudo-photons, basically. Pseudo-photons. Pseudo-photons, so. they're called, because they don't actually – exist long enough to be detected as photons. Um, They are photons that are, if you like to think of it, for want of a better term, they are pulled out of the photonic field, the electromagnetic field, and they transfer force between the positively charged and the negatively charged item and draw those things together. How is the attraction of drawing things together achieved? To understand that, we have to understand how like charges, two positives or two negatives, repel. The way to understand that is to think of you and me as two particles, and we've got a medicine ball, say a a 10-kilo medicine ball. And what I'm going to do, I've got the medicine ball and I'm going to chest pass it to you and you're going to catch it. We are both stood on ice skates, by the way. So I'm going to okay. push the medicine ball away from me 
and I'm because of equal and opposite reaction, I'm going to slide slightly backwards. You're going to catch that medicine ball, absorb that force and slide slightly backwards. Then you can send it back to me with a chest pass and you'll slide even further back and I'll slide further back when I catch it. And then as long as we're close enough that we can pass that pseudo photon between us, we'll continue to push each other further away. And then when we're beyond the range of where our strength is, we won't push each other away anymore. So that's how like charges repel. Okay. To work out how we do the actual attraction, what you have to do is understand that the medicine ball travels between you and I in a time frame from its inertial frame of reference, the time frame that that photon takes to travel between you and I is zero. No time yeah. at all. Yeah. Because photons travel at the speed of light, and because of time dilation, at the speed of light, time has slowed down to zero. No time passes ever. Ergo, it is perfectly acceptable to view a photon as traveling forwards in time or backwards in time, depending on your inertial frame of reference. So oppositely charged electromagnetic particles are just viewing the photon as traveling backwards in time. Ergo, instead of repelling, they come together. Okay. That's how it works. So there's a little physics lecture for folks, just for fun. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> anyway. For anti-inflammatory effect, you need to be grounded because if you have oxidative damage to your cells and tissues, you'll be inflamed as a function of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's number three is ground yourself electrically. It's not crystal waving woo-woo. It's not happy stuff. It's actual science. The other things that are important to understand about grounding are the moment you're grounded, your blood viscosity reduces by a factor of three. That's incredible. That's massive, yeah. It's incredible. How does that work? So this is a good solution for people with high blood pressure. Exactly. Now, how does that work? Well, when you ground electrically, your red blood cells attract a coating of electrons around their cell membrane, and they all repel each other. Blood being a non-Newtonian fluid means that those cells can now no longer clump. They're all evenly dispersed throughout the fluid. Thus, its effective viscosity drops by such a huge degree. So your heart has to pump so much less forcibly to move the same amount of fluid and the same amount of time to the same tissues. So advisable for people who may be at risk of clotting as well, then, you might say. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, okay. healing is more expedited when you ground regularly for a significant amount of time. If you have an what aberrant you cortisol to? profile, that will normalize. And the second you ground electrically, your brainwave activity changes from fight and flight to rest and recuperation. Interesting. So um, and what would you stuff. call a, a substantial amount of time? An hour, 30 minutes? Oh, as much of the time as is possible and feasible in your lifestyle. Okay. I'll give yeah, you an example okay. of what we do here in this house. We sleep grounded, the bed is grounded. There's a mat under the fitted bed sheet and the electrical connection is made by body moisture through the sheet to the grounding mat. The grounding mat is connected to a stake outside in the ground, okay. and that's okay. how we ground the bed. You can also get a three-pin plug, sorry, that way in the UK. The, the, yep. the, the earth is on the top and because we're on the other side of the world. It's the other way around in our plugs. We have exactly. the active and phase yes. at the top and the earth at the bottom. You guys have it that way. Um, that's another aside. doesn't matter. Um, you can do it that way as well, although there is a risk of what they call dirty electricity when you do that, but that's for another day as well. We can talk about that another day. So that's number three, yeah. ground. Okay. The fourth most important thing you can do, in my mind, for inflammation, again, sounds crazy, but really is not. Yeah. If it is the time of day where you are, where the sun is below the horizon, i.e. night time, and what you should do is block blue light from your eyes. That's what I'm mm. doing right now. That's why the crazy glasses. Because uh -huh. it's yeah, night time. It's half past nine at night. And at this time of the year, it actually gets dark about 5.30 in the afternoon in this, oh. in this country. Okay. So yeah, I've had these on for a bit. 
Um, we're going into winter down here, and it's bloody yeah. cold, I can tell you. Anyway, block blue light. Now, why? Because it's to do with circadian rhythms. Your eyes detect the color of light entering your eyes, and if there's much blue, your eyes are your body is convinced it's daytime, it's it's high noon sort of thing. And so you, you can never rest, you can never relax properly. It's one of those things that interferes with sleep, inflammation, circadian rhythms, all of that kind of stuff. So to get back to a more natural um, way of being, we block out the blue light. I should, before I moved off the grounding, I should have also said when I'm not sleeping, I'm generally sat at this desk working because it's I work and sleep and sleep and work pretty much. Um, yeah. And at the desk I'm sat at right now, there's a mat, a, a, a mouse pad on my desk, which is also grounded. So I'm grounded as long as I'm touching the mat right now. Okay. Right. Um, and then when I'm not doing either working or sleeping, I'm generally exercising, which I will generally do grounded as well. So anyway, yeah. blue light, block it after dark. Tricks for young players. The lenses that you use is the clip-on version. They need to be dark orange color, as you can see here. Not yellow, because yellow is only a partial blue block, not effective. They have to be dark orange color, proper blue blockers. And certainly yeah. not those ones that are sold as computer glasses, which are supposedly blue blocking lenses that don't distort the color. They're clear. Think about it for a second. If you can see blue, it's not blocked, yeah. is it? No, there's not a filter there. Right. So um, that's the colour they should be, that colour. So that's number four. And the fifth most important thing a person can do for their inflammation is the right amount of the right exercise at the right intensity on the right schedule, which is yeah. high-intensity burst and repeat activity and or resistance training weights or elastic band, you know, variable resistance training ideas, a la John Jackish, X3, that kind of stuff. Um, you do that three times a week, 45 minutes max at a session, and you'd get at it at high intensity. Yeah. Um, no aerobic training, no zone two training, none of that nonsense. So you'd be training in zone one or in zone three. Zone one being everything below about 60% of your heart rate maximum, i.e. just brisk walking, activities of daily living, whatever you do occupationally for most people, fine. Or high intensity, avoid the middle, is what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, I only found out about this zone two stuff because a friend brought it up while we were running. Mm. And I went off around the internet and I kept bumping into Peter Atia, yeah. And I just could I couldn't find any real science coming out of his mouth. That's because and he kept he's not a real scientist. That's why. <laughs> so he kept he kept saying that you're going to build your cardio base, but that doesn't sound like a real thing to me. So I was a bit concerned there. Basically, what Peter Atia is doing there is mindlessly parroting the classic old school exercise physiology, dogma, paradigm, ideas about things, which is just wrong. Uh, for those that want to know, I have three advanced research degrees. I spent 25 years plus in academia. My first advanced research degree was in exercise physiology. The second one is in human nutrition, and the third one was in cardiovascular pathophysiology, so heart disease, basically. Um, so I'm not just saying Peter is wrong about exercise physiology because I just felt like it. I actually am an exercise physiologist, and he is not. He's a physician. And his training is allopathic medicine, and that's where he should confine his commentary because that's where he's competent not an exercise physiology. And actually having seen some of his videos on aspects of allopathic medicinal ideas, certainly those around my other area of expertise, which I can comment on, that being cardiovascular pathophysiology, heart disease. Yeah. No, he's wrong on that one as well. 
Not impressed with Peter Atia at all, is what I'm telling you. Not remotely impressed with him. So, right, you've just set me up to go on to uh, high blood pressure, yep. heart, and, and stuff like that. Excellent. Talking about the... Uh, cool. But I'd, just very quickly, on the on the, the blue blockers, yep. are you saying for that you, that's going to reduce inflammation just because getting your circadian rhythm in order yep. will reduce... Yep. Fine. Absolutely. Yeah. All right then. Yeah. So statins, high blood pressure, yeah. heart attacks, people yeah. with stents. Yeah. Why might it be advisable for these people to switch over to a carnivore lifestyle? Right. Because the cause of cardiovascular disease is inflammation at its root cause, chronic systemic inflammation. And specifically uh, inflammation of the vascular epithelial cells on the high pressure side of the blood circulation. It might interest those that don't know to understand that atherosclerosis heart disease occurs only in arteries, never ever in veins. And actually it's only in the largest of the arteries. Why is that? Because there are several things that are required for heart disease to occur. Physical damage to the vascular epithelial beds is one of those things, and that is almost invariably moderated by elevated blood pressure. Right. So that only happens on the high, high pressure side of your vascular tree. On the venous side, the blood return side, with blood has a laminar flow and a much lower pressure returning back to the heart from having subserved delivering oxygen and nutrients and things out to the cells. It's just to kind of meander back at low pressure to be once again pumped out under pressure. On the other side, it's always the high pressure side that suffers the heart disease atherosclerosis, never ever veins, unless you take a vein out of someone's leg and graft it into the other side, like a bypass, and then that vein that's been put on the high-pressure side, sure as you'll find little green apples on little green apple trees, that starts developing atherosclerosis because of the damage because of the elevated pressure. What is the single biggest cause of elevated blood pressure? Well, guess what? It's chronic systemic inflammation. So that's interesting. The other thing that's interesting out of that, you kind of mentioned statins. Statins are a class of drug which are designed to reduce cholesterol in your blood. Under the false belief that cholesterol is causal in heart disease, it is not. How do I prove that? Simple. Atherosclerosis occurs only in, vein, in arteries and never in veins. Veins carry the same blood, which contains the same cholesterol. Gotcha. Done. Gotcha. Finish. End of end of argument. Oh, but there's cholesterol found in atherosclerotic plaques. Okay, great. Yes, you're right, there is. Do you know how much? Relatively, by mass of an atherosclerotic lesion, how much of it's cholesterol? Less than oh, one-tenth of one percent, usually. Less than a percent of a percent. Less than one tenth of one percent of an atherosclerotic lesion is generally cholesterol. I, I watched a presentation a while ago where someone suggested that the presence of cholesterol there was to actually help heal the, the damage. Correct. It is. Okay. That's one of the roles of cholesterol is in healing or attempting to heal. So, of course, cholesterol delivering molecules such as LDL are attracted to such damage, that's why you find it there. But in very small amounts, less than one tenth of one percent. The rest of it's scar tissue, white blood cells, fibrous material. At late stage there's a lot of calcium deposited in there. Mm -hmm. Very little cholesterol is found there. And the cholesterol that is found there is not native cholesterol. It's cholesterol that's been deranged by our old friend Oxidation, generally, or if it's not oxidized, it's glycated, if it isn't both. Glycated, by the way, is damaged by sugar rather than damaged by oxygen or oxidative so agents. So the glucose is fused to the molecule. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, plaque is atherosclerotic plaque. Is that the same stuff you get on your teeth no. from um, making <laughs> no. too much gum? No. no. Um, okay. uh, plaque is a, an umbrella term for stiffened, hardened tissue of any kind, usually with mineralization. So, plaque can form on teeth. That's usually an exoskeleton put there by the bacteria that live on your on the surfaces of your teeth and around your gums, as distinct from the plaque in your arteries, which is generally scar tissue, fibrous tissue, and at very late stage it becomes calcified. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Scar tissue in the veins or yeah. arteries yeah. can't be a good thing. Never, never a good thing. No. Also completely, um, you know, the only the only time that they can find any evidence of atherosclerosis in human remains of any age where there's any tissue that's been preserved at all, you find it in groups of human beings post-agricultural revolution, humans eating grains. Interesting, yeah. isn't it? Inflammation. Yeah. We've been eating meat and animal fat for four and a half million years. We're very, very well adapted to that. That's not the cause of the heart disease, and neither is cholesterol. It's inflammation. Slam dunk, end yeah. of. It's almost as if I could cool. write a thesis on it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and so a stent is just, it's something that's been put in the heart to... Yeah, place. a stent is like a, a wire cage. I don't know if you've ever seen, as the kids used to play with them, those those finger trap things. That you stick it yeah. in, in the, it's like that, only it works in reverse. You put it in thin, and then they expand yeah. it out. And what it does is you put it in an area where a, a cardiac vessel has been blocked by an atherosclerotic lesion, scar tissue, and the, and the the flow through that um, through that artery is being compromised. And so what it's basically doing is, is it's a cage that's forcing that lumen open again to allow blood to flow again that's that's why they'd put a stent in and then of course after so a certain period of time they're supposed to remove it as well and often they forget to do it and that can cause problems but yeah. oh, interesting yeah well, i see okay well yeah thanks for that cool. um pcos just briefly like i said before we started i know you i know you and many others have gone on about mm. about this but yeah, for the for the sake of some of the women in my life, could you yeah. please explain how a carnivore diet would benefit yeah, some of the PCOS is basically a hormonally driven disease process. The exact linkage to inflammation is less clear in this case because it's a hormonal thing. However, the correct species appropriate diet for a human being tends to set that human being's hormonal system back in balance. Generally, the hormonal imbalances in a person are attributable partly to genetics, sure, partly to environment, sure, partly to lifestyle, sure. Mostly, it's diet, eating plant materials that are toxic, pro-inflammatory. Inflammation in and of itself can disturb someone's uh, hormonal balancer. So if there is a clear linkage, that would be what it would be in, in my world, in my estimation. But it's less clear, it's less well-researched than the heart disease one, which, by the way, is absolutely yeah. unequivocally clear in the literature. Anyone that will stand up on their hind legs and say, the evidence is clear for LDL, cholesterol, and saturated fat causing heart disease, has not read the literature or isn't interested in science or the truth. That's something that's, that's been bought and paid for. It's that clear. It really is. There's no two ways about it. Um, PCOS less so, but really, almost every disease, complaint, or condition you could think of that people generally experience in modern life, pretty much every one, you can put down to inflammation at some level, causally. And so if you can live a lifestyle that's maximally anti-inflammatory, it reduces the likelihood of any of those disease processes. 
There are no guarantees in life, and I'm not offering any. But if you you take those five things I've mentioned in this video and you religiously apply all five every day, that will reduce your inflammatory burden to such a degree that your likelihood of suffering any of these or suffering undue discomfort, pain, suffering, or early death, it will reduce the risk of that to its lowest possible level, I would I would estimate. So, or once again, let's just summarize them. One, eat a carnivore diet. Now, the appropriate carnivore diet is consisting of a muscle meats, not organs, muscle meat, and associated fat of large ruminant animals, which boils down to beef. Basically, 80% of my diet is beef. The other 20% is other animals. Pretty much. With the odd plate of blueberries, which I understand is not an animal, and I'm quite happy to hand in my carnival card if that upsets anybody. Which one, sorry? Blueberries. Oh, okay. Yeah, not an animal. Yeah. I get that. I understand I, that. I quite like the, uh, the coffee animal. Yeah, I quite like coffee too. I've got a coffee... Well, I had, I did have a coffee here. Um, oh, some bastard drank make it. One, but I didn't want you. I don't want you to see me drinking a coffee. To be honest with you, which so. bastards drank my coffee? It's unbelievable. Anyway, that Ted fella, isn't it? It is. It's that yellow bastard again. Anyway, there you go. So, carnivore diet. So so it's it's meat and animal on, fat. Go on, James. Yeah. So, um, I was watching Sean O'Mara yep. the other day, and he was talking about visceral fat. Yep. Is there, so it, he was saying that it's essentially toxic to have it on your body. Yes. Does that mean that it's toxic to consume a diabetic cow's fat? No, because the toxicity that Sean is referring to there is in the metabolic effects, largely. Anyone that says you store a lot of toxins in your fat, well, sure, maybe you do, but That doesn't mean that a person that doesn't carry extra fat is less um, vulnerable to toxins in the environment. I, I think. I th- I, my my belief is my my interpretation of people that say visceral fat is toxic and dangerous is that well yes it's physiologically dangerous, and the toxicity is in the metabolic side effects of being overweight in that way. I think largely. Fine. Then there are the others that might argue, oh, yes, the, the actual toxins in the fat are the issue. Okay, fine. That's for another day. We can argue that out as and when. But you would, you would argue that the lipid profile of grass fed beef is going to be better or, or more nutritious than. <laughs> Look, I'm, than I'm, corn fed. I'm far more interested that a person eats a species appropriate diet consisting largely of the muscle meat of cows and associated fat than worrying about the provenance of that beef so much. Any carnival diet of that nature is vastly superior to any diet containing any amount of plant material to speak of. It's kind of like it's the the one percent of stuff, really, on top. So the 99% of the battle is get yourself on a carnival diet consisting of muscle meat, not organs. You don't need organs. You don't need nose to tail. You don't need liver. Muscle meat is fine. In fact, liver is contraindicated, it seems, but that's also for another day. So that's the first thing, carnivore diet. Second thing, cereal products. I'll give you a link, James, that you can put under the video on your channel, basically, where people can just go straight to the shop. Off. Yep. Get yourself on cereal products. Get yourself on cereal products yesterday. Yes, I'll earn a commission if you buy them. I make no apology for that. Um, nonetheless, Adult stem cell circulation is vastly important to the renewal and repair of your body, your lifespan, your longevity, frankly, because of the way that works, and it's vastly anti-inflammatory. So get that happening, get it happening yesterday. Or don't, it's no skin off my nose, it doesn't change my life. Number three, get yourself electrically grounded for as much of the time as you possibly can in your life. Number four, block blue light out of your eyes after dark when it's night time. Number five, undertake high-intensity burst repeat HIIT style training and or resistance training with weights and or 
variable resistance elastic band type methodologies such as X3, John Jackish style stuff. Um, those are the things you need to concern yourselves with before anything else. They're the top five. That's probably 95% upwards of the battle with inflammation. Other than that, be mindful. Look after yourself psychologically, mentally. Um, meditate if that works for you. Have some um, change of scenery things if that works for you. Have some hobbies if that works for you. Whatever it is, so long as those hobbies aren't in and of themselves destructive. Like dirty, dirty bear, James. Dirty bear. Stay off that. Yes. Um, so well, it's not a hobby, though, is it? Well, I don't know. Some people make it a hobby, don't they? Some people make <laughs> it a way of living, do, to yeah. be fair. Um, oh, I'm carnivore, I am. So I am. I'm carnivore. But come weekend, I'm down. Boom, I am. Drinking dirty, yeah. dirty beer. No, that's not going to work for you. That's that's kind of no. productive. Um, those are the things that, are, that I would suggest for people. Those are the important things. Okay. And well, everything yeah, else beyond great. that is a five percenter. In my mind. So, if we've got a couple more minutes, sure. I'd like to just talk about how you would. Obviously, this isn't a consultation, so just generally speaking, how might you advise someone trying to transition from amateur athlete through to kind of semi-pro? Yeah. Um, I'm talking about training twice a day. Yeah. I mean, you've already said hit. You've yeah. I've watched you talk about the zone two thing mm -hmm. plenty. You know, I'm not I'm not going for one hour runs at zone mm -hmm. two. I'm, yeah. It's 35 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, yeah. good pace. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I also I was wondering if you could briefly talk about um, cadence in running yeah. from a, from the physiological sports perspective. Yeah. Okay. The first thing I would say is training twice a day in my mind is contraindicated. Once a day should be sufficient. And if, you know, if you don't feel like you're getting your training done in one session, there's something wrong with your intensity. You should be too, so for you should me, be too buggered to train the, twice after your first training. The, the second training is always a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class in the evening. Okay. Uh, it's, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. But I feel like my cardio has improved. I've started running in September and I definitely have improved okay. my cardio. So what's the reason for the um, running? Um, partly because I love it and partly because I, I wanted to improve my cardio because that does translate into jiu-jitsu, into, into the fight world. You know, if, mm. if you can outlast the other guy, you're slightly more yeah. likely to win okay. if you're at an equal All right. level. So I understand the mental illness of being addicted to cardiovascular zone two training. Mm -hmm. I was involved in that myself for a number of years. And indeed I was involved in a sport that required me because of the way that sport was being managed and run by the so-called powers that be that required that kind of fitness. So I did that for years actually. And, and I know the damage that that can do, but really is contraindicated. You really don't want to be doing that in my mind. Zone two training. Yeah. Now, if your yeah. running is all zone three, I don't have a problem with that. That should cave you in within 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. At a consistent pace of running. If you can run longer than that, then your intensity is too low. Your speed of running is too slow. So you, you, need, to, you need to work out what your critical velocity is. So do a, a, a Google search on critical velocity in running and go through the yeah. procedure of working out what your critical velocity is and then work out specifically what your critical velocity over 25 minutes is or 30 minutes at most and make sure you're running that fast or faster. Yeah. Until you cannot All run right. another step and you are absolutely caved in and you are spent. And every running session should be at that intensity. There are no easy days. There are no easy runs. There are no, that's just, that's not training. That's just incidental exercise. And that's just going to wear you down over years, actually. And it's not going to improve your cardiovascular conditioning. Okay. So I'd stay okay. right the hell away from that. Your jujitsu training is, is both specific to the fitness requirements of your event and it's technical so generalized fitness training outside of your technical jiu-jitsu training is 
strictly speaking, not necessary, but I understand why a person would feel like, oh, it's helpful. So I'm not going to say don't go running at all, but what I'm going to say to you is make sure you keep that intensity right up. Do not ever let your intensity lag and have an easy day, an easy run. Your your heart rate should always be 80 and 90% upwards of your heart rate maximum while you're running. Otherwise, don't bother. Would, okay. be, would be my advice. All right. At any level, because yeah, it's all great. relative to your capacity. So the, the advice is the same, whatever your fitness level is. So it's maximum intensity for you over 30 minutes at whatever distance you can cover over 30 minutes. Or right. a shorter distance than that at an even faster pace. Never, ever a longer distance at a slower pace, ever. Cool? I'll take that into consideration, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That would be my advice. Thanks. What a person decides to do in their own life is their own thing, of course. You do you. But uh, you ask me yeah, what my be. advice would be, that's what it would be. No, thank you. Cool. My pleasure. Um, I think, oh, well, if we've got a couple of minutes, I saw it. Literally, yes, literally Chaffee, a couple of minutes. Yeah. Anthony Chaffee talking about micro teeth in muscle fibers. Could you just. Oh, yeah. Micro tearing. Okay. So one of the things that's the thought teeth. to be the precipitant of your muscle getting fitter when you train is that when you use a muscle at a high enough intensity, muscle fibers develop micro tears. There's physical tearing that occurs to those muscle fibers. Yeah. Both externally and internally in their actual workings. That the physical protein structures that make up the sliding filaments. And yeah. That's a physical injury that the body needs to heal from, and the way it heals is it reforms the actin and myosin filaments in a more robust, thicker, heavier chain. And as such, that's what causes the muscle fibre to become bigger, among other things. Hypertrophy. Yeah. Do they have, do they have little mechanical teeth on them? Like tiny um, little... You can think of them as, as teeth, if you like. But then they're more like a um, more like a sticky pad thing, like more like a spider's foot or something like that, where you've got a thick okay. and a thin filament, protein filaments, and they overlap each other. And what happens is the one filament will grab the other and step forward, release, grab and step, grab and step on iterative binding sites throughout a, a contraction cycle. Yeah. And and that's how a muscle contraction is facilitated. Again, uh, probably you know for another day, the, the whole how does muscle contraction work? That's a whole series yeah. of lectures I used to give over weeks when I was when I was teaching the subject back in the day when I was an exercise physiologist first and foremost. Yeah. And then, in thirty seconds, yeah, what is happening at the cellular level when a muscle goes into? complete spasm when it just goes so tight that you can't even stretch it what, what's happening there what generally occur is occurring there is that what a lot of people don't realize is that when a muscle is contracting that requires atp it also requires as much or more atp than that to shut off a muscle contraction so okay. atp is required not only to contract but also to relax so when you get the cramp and it's what that is is that your ATP has dropped to a level where there isn't sufficient ATP to actually turn that contraction off. So you've got tetanus, you've got a locking of the fibres, and that's right. what cramping is. Okay. In, in short. Oh, I could spend another hour digging into that one with you, but... Book it. I'm well, quite happy to have another yeah. discussion where we can talk about technical... I mean, this stuff fascinates me. I could talk about it all day. I just don't have time this evening to talk about it all night so but I've yeah, got you. absolutely book it yeah. in and we'll do it listen it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure thank you for uh, asking me to um open up my brain and basically spew it all over you it's 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 been great and, and i look forward to doing it well, again in the future yeah i've enjoyed it but thank you so much for your time really appreciate it thanks take care all right stop talking.